Uh, we're excited to hear from uh, Professor Charles Knuckles, uh, one of our own. Um, just to briefly introduce those of you that don't know Charles's work already, uh, Charles got his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Chicago, a uh, master's degree at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in South Asian Studies, and ultimately a PhD at the University of Chicago in the Department of South Asian Languages and Civilizations uh, in the field of anthropology, although that is somewhat disputed if you consult uh, the Department of Comparative Human Development at Chicago also claims Charles as <laughs> an alumnus. <laughs> because um, in fact, his advisor was in that department. Uh, but uh, Charles is a, uh, Professor Knuckles is a uh, prolific scholar. He's been um, uh, funded by entities, including the Fulbright Organization, National Institutes of Mental Health, National Endowment of the Humanities, National Science Foundation. He conducts field work in, uh, he's conducted field work in most substantially, I think in, in uh, India, in South Asia, but also in New Zealand and Japan and the United States. Um, uh, I believe we're going to hear about the US portion of that today. Um, and he's written a, a number of uh, books and articles I would particularly recommend uh, to all of our students. Uh, we don't read enough of the work of our own faculty in our classes, but Culture is a Problem That Cannot Be Solved is a book that I'm particularly frequently pushing on my students uh, to think about um, how uh, we oftentimes treat paradox. We, we attempt to resolve cultural problems through paradox uh, at any rate. So uh, we're excited to hear from you, Charles. And so I'm going to turn it over to you um, and uh, take it. I'll let you give us our title because I, I, I have it roughly in mind, but not right in front of me. So go ahead, Charles. Well, thank you very much. I think the title is The Mountain Meadows Massacre and the Slaughter of Innocents, but I may have that wrong. Uh, this paper is a what, what some would call a proof of concept exercise. It's not a, uh, a publishable paper in the sense that it provides all the evidence it would require to prove its, its thesis. It's very much preliminary to, to that, although it does exceed the status of a speculation. So proof of con concept is how I would put it, and um, it, it has a long way to go in terms of being fully borne out with consideration of all the evidence. So with that, uh, with that disclaimer out of the way, I will begin. James Fraser in The Golden Bough noted that religious ideas seem to be associated with the theme of the scapegoat. As he writes in volume one, quote, the notion that we can transfer our guilt and suffering to some other being who will bear them for us is familiar to the savage mind. It arises from the very obvious confusion between the physical and the mental, between the mental and the immaterial, uh, because it is possible to shift a load of wood, stones, or whatnot from our back to the back of another, the savage fancies that it is equally possible to shift the burden of pain and sorrows to another who will suffer them on his behalf. Upon this idea, he acts, and the result is an endless number of unamiable devices for palming off onto someone else the trouble which a man shrinks from bearing himself. In short, the principle of vicarious suffering is commonly associated and practiced by races who stand in a low level of social and intellectual culture. Well, <clears throat> René Girard, uh, the uh, intellectual historian who died just a couple of years ago, notes this passage with approval and praises Fraser for detecting the concealment of the violent impulse that lurks within the right of sacrifice. Still, the modern mind cannot bring itself to acknowledge the principle behind that mechanism, which in a single movement curtails reciprocal violence and imposes structure on the community. At the heart of sacrifice, in other words, there is a violence displaced from its original target within the community and outward onto an innocent victim who is made to bear the full load of the community's reciprocal violence, a violence which unchecked could lead to the breakdown of the community. Thus, we arrive at Girard's definition of religion, quote, any phenomenon associated with acts of remembering, commemorating, and perpetuating a unanimity that springs from the murder of a surrogate victim can be termed religious. I wouldn't go that far myself, but that's, that's what Girard does. Uh, this is a functionalist argument that begins by observing that vengeance if, uh, is an unending process, 
Uh, if it is, it can hardly be invoked to restrain the violent impulses of society. In fact, vengeance must be restrained. Take, for example, uh, this little passage from the work of Robert Lowe many years ago. Quote, from the supreme law of group solidarity, <clears throat> it follows that where an individual has injured a member of another group, his own group shield him while the opposing group support the injured man's claims for compensation or revenge. Thence there may develop blood feuds and civil wars. The Chukchi generally make peace after the first act of retribution, but among the Ifigal, the struggle may go on interminably." Unquote. The conclusion Lowy draws is that as long as there exists no independent body capable of taking the place of the injured party and taking upon itself responsibility of, for revenge, the danger of interminable escalation remains. Uh, here we find uh, Malinowski's statement of a very similar state of affairs, quote, uh, the means of restoring a disturbed tribal equilibrium are slow and cumbersome. We have not found any arrangement or usage which could be classed as a form of administration of justice or according to a code and by fixed methods, unquote. The solution is sacrifice. <clears throat> the sacrificial process furnishes an outlet for those violent impulses that cannot be mastered by self-restraint, a partial outlet to be sure, but always renewable, and one whose efficacy has been attested by a number of reliable witnesses. The sacrificial process prevents the spread of violence by keeping vengeance in check. It is necessary, however, to choose the sacrificial victim carefully. It should be someone or some group that can bear the weight of the vengeance and the violence projected onto it. The innocent victim is the best able to accomplish this. We could detect the process at work as long as we follow the sacrificial impulse of the Christian tradition. Our willingness, says Gerard, to cross the threshold depends on our constantly deepening ability to detect mimetic polarizations and scapegoating. And this deepening was long ago triggered by the influence on us of the Bible and above all of the gospels." Unquote. In other words, all it takes to crack open our myth and all similar myths is the application to them of the principle of the innocent victim unjustly scapegoated. The model is the story of the crucifixion in the Christian gospels. All right, now down to, down to particulars. In September of 1857, a wagon train of 140 individuals known as the Fancher Party after its leader, Alexander Fancher, traveled south through Utah on its way to California via the Spanish Trail. At a place called Mountain Meadows in Southern Utah, the wagons were attacked by rifle shots from the surrounding hills. The Fancher party defended itself by circling the wagons, wheels chained together, and digging shallow trenches to serve as rifle pits. Seven immigrants were killed during the first couple of minutes and were buried within the encirclement. 16 more were wounded. The attack continued for five days, during which time the besieged immigrants ran low on food and water. It appears that most, if not all, the attackers were white Mormons and that some were wore face paint to make it appear that they were Native Americans. Now the territory of Utah, as all you know, was formed in 1848 following the Mexican War and the extension of United States authority. Shortly before, immigrants from Missouri and further east had come to the area to escape persecution, the largest scale exodus of religious refugees in American history. The immigrants, of course, were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormons, in the 10 years since their arrival in Utah, they had created a theocratically governed society of nearly 100,000 people, established more than 300 separate towns and communities, and built a self-sufficient economy large enough to sustain colonizing missions as far north as Canada and as far south as Mexico. Today, Mormons still constitute the majority of residents in the state of Utah, but the church's membership uh, at, uh, at present the church's membership is present in almost every nation and now totals more than 15 million, uh, much of that outside the United States. <clears throat> Rodney Stark years ago called Mormonism the most rapidly growing religion in the world. In fact, he says to detect comparable rate of growth, one would have to return to Islam in the seventh and eighth centuries. To go back to the events of 1857, on Friday, September 11th, and yes, it was September 11th, 
two Mormon militiamen approached the Fancher party with a white flag and were soon followed by Indian agent and mil militia officer John D. Lee. Lee told the battle-weary immigrants that he had negotiated a truce with the Paiutes and that he and his fellow militiamen would escort the survivors to safety under Mormon protection. The immigrants, however, would have to agree to give up their arms. Otherwise, Lee explained, the Indians would attack again. The immigrants accepted this and were led out of their fortifications. At a prearranged signal, the Mormon militiamen turned and executed the men of the Fancher party. And then in company with an unknown, but probably very small number of Paiute allies, attacked and killed the women and children. 18 of the children, too young, it was thought to remember anything, were spared and taken in by Mormon families in a nearby town. 17 <clears throat> of them were later reclaimed by the US Army and returned to relatives, while one, a girl, was not returned and lived out her life among the Mormons. The Mountain Meadow Massacres of 1857 is said to be the worst mass murder of white people in the history of the American West. The fact that it was done at the direction of white Mormons and largely by them has made it notorious, but also inexplicable. Why would Mormon pioneers who were by all accounts decent and law-abiding citizens participate in a mass slaughter, killing somewhere around 120 people, uh, many of them women and children? Contemporary uh, members of the church find the event inexplicable and also deeply troubling since it strikes at the core uh, elements of their identity a feeling that they are and have always been misunderstood and that Mormons are the true victims of persecution. It is hard to reconcile the victimhood with the perpetration of an atrocity. Mountain Meadows is therefore not just an episode in the bloody history of the settlement of the West. It's something else. And there are conventional explanations, so let's consider some of those. Over the years, there have been many attempts to explain the events of September 1857. One of those used to hold that the perpetrators were mostly Paiute Indians, not white Mormons. And this was the view officially enshrined in Utah school textbooks. Another view was, and still is, that the immigrants somehow brought the calamity on themselves by provoking members of the Mormon community as they traversed the state. Mormons had settled in Utah in 1847, just after the United States defeated Mexico, and in the next 10 years had enjoyed almost complete isolation in which to develop a theocratic territory under the leader of their prophet, Brigham Young. In 1857, however, President James Buchanan was increasingly alarmed by reports that Brigham Young planned to create his own independent nation. And fearing secession, he dispatched an army under the command of General Sidney Albert Johnson, Johnston, to put down the Mormon insurrection. Mormons in Utah interpreted this as another in a long series of government sponsored efforts to eradicate them because of their peculiar beliefs and kinship practices. I note in passing here that since 1853, Mormonism had officially sanctioned polygyny. The wagon train entered Utah just ahead of Johnston's army and unknowingly triggered a defensive response on the part of people preparing for a war of self-preservation. That's one explanation. Still another explanation, still current, is that the Fancher party consisted partly of people from Missouri, the state whose governor had issued an extermination order against the Mormons only 20 years before when a Mormon colony had been established near the city of Independence. Some said the immigrants had spoken favorably of the extermination order. It was even alleged by some members of the wagon train that some members of the wagon train had been among those who had murdered Mormonism's founder and first prophet, Joseph Smith, in 1844. The massacre then could be understood as some kind of vengeance for past wrongs, either real or perceived, against all Mormons uh, or their leaders in the past. Most of these explanations have been in circulation for the century and a half since the massacre took place. What is the current state of history on the question? In the last decade or so, two theories have been put forth. 
In 2002, Will Bagley, in his book, Blood of the Prophets, suggested that Brigham Young had ordered the attack on the wagon train in order to send a message to Washington, D.C. that Mormons would defend their territory against invasion or incursion by forces from the East. Uh, the author of the 2008 history massacre at Mountain Meadows questioned the validity of Bagley's theory and relate the event to the response of local leaders in Southern Utah to the perception that they were under attack. They, the authors of that book, find no evidence for a conspiracy that reached to the top of the Mormon hierarchy. On one point, however, both accounts agree. The role of the Paiute Indians in the massacre has been greatly exaggerated and white men, not Indians, were the main organizers and perpetrators of the killings, both of the men and the women and the children. It is easy to lose oneself in the details or to translate the horror of the massacre into endless variations on the theme of conspiracy. The recent debate between Bagley and Turley, Turley was the chief author of the second book I mentioned, um, church historian, uh, the, the recent debate between Bagley and Turley comes down to the question of what did Brigham Young know and when did he know it? I suggest that these questions are largely beside the point when we consider the greater issue that looms over all others. How could apparently decent and upright Mormon men kill women and children who were surely innocent, even if we allow the possibility that the wagon train's men were indirectly or even directly responsible for the so-called blood of the prophets. All the histories written on the Mountain Meadows massacre founder on this question because none of the explanations offered from paranoid defensiveness to so-called blood atonement is sufficient to account for an act so apparently evil. But there is a solution to the problem of evil, I will suggest, which begins by reconsidering the definition of its victims. What if we start from the proposition that the women and children were killed, not because the murderers thought they were guilty and still less because they thought the women and children would bear witness. Such views would suggest that they were killed despite the fact that they were innocent, but precisely because they were innocent and known to be so by the men who slaughtered them. In other words, they were killed because they were, knowing they were known to be innocent, not guilty. The next section is called Blood of the Innocents. Among the perpetrators who later in later years admitted to the killings, uh, there were none who argued that the women and children were murdered because they were guilty of some misdoing. The only reasonable argument that could be put forward was that they posed a threat to the killers should the details of the massacre ever come to light. There is reason, of course, for accepting the logic of this account. After all, children under the age of eight were not killed, presumably because they were too young to be considered credible witnesses. Uh, many of the women and older children were not simply killed. This is the key point. Many of the women and children were not simply killed as their husbands and fathers were with a single shot to the back of the head. They were bludgeoned and hacked to death with a savagery that requires a different kind of explanation. Details of the kind I just mentioned were not available until fairly recently. In 1999, the monument at Mountain Meadows uh, site uh, was being renovated by the site's current owner, the, the church. A backhoe accidentally unearthed a chamber filled with bones. And these were later exhumed and forensically examined by anthropologist Shannon Novak at the University of Utah. Until then, there, were no, there was no forensic analysis of the massacre because none of, of the remains had ever been exhumed. Novak had about a month to perform her analysis before the governor, Levitt of the state, demanded that the bones be reinterred. The month was long enough, however, to reveal that the men had in fact been killed execution style while most of the women and children appear to have been beaten to death. According to Novak, quote, bludgeoning was evident in six of the reconstructed heads, one old adult female, two adult males and three children. The children's head had extensive crushing indicating blows that were delivered with great force. Although the militiamen denied killing children, William Stewart and George Adair allegedly bragged about the murders. Stewart claimed he uh, held the, uh, I believe the word he 
to use was damned. He held the damned Gentile babies by the heels and cracked their skulls over the wagon tire, unquote. While Adair attempted to, quote, imitate the pitiful crushing sounds, unquote. Uh, that was quoted in Bagley. Further evidence of the unique cruelty of the massacre is to be found in the immediate aftermath. The next day, Lee and his accomplices returned to the meadows to bury the dead. They did not make much of an effort. The bodies were only lightly covered for the ground was hard and the men, quote, did not have sufficient tools to dig with, unquote. So the bodies were left for the most part for the coyotes and wolves to devour. It was 18 months before the US, before US military personnel were dispatched from Los Angeles with orders to bury the victims. When they arrived, this was the scene they discovered, quote, women's hair in detached locks and masses hung to the large sage brushes and was strewn over the ground in many places. Parts of little children's dresses and female costume dangled from the shrubbery or lay scattered about. And among these here and there on every hand for at least a mile in the direction of the road by two miles east and west there gleamed bleached white by the weather the skulls and other bones of those who had suffered." Unquote. For our purposes, it does not matter who killed the women and the children. Some Paiute Indians may or may not have been involved. The available evidence suggests that white militiamen were the chief perpetrators, but such evidence is limited and piecemeal and cannot be considered totally reliable. But no one denies that the militiamen were present or that they masterminded the attack that resulted in the deaths of 120 people. If they did not kill the women and children, they certainly saw it done, and there is definitely no evidence that they tried to stop it. On the contrary, there are reports of specific named white men who went to special lengths to ensure that the women and children were dead. The question therefore remains, what would provoke this level of violence against victims whom no one believed were guilty of anything? The next section is called mimetic violence and the theory of sacrificial crisis. I propose here several explanatory frameworks, all constructed to one extent or another from the ideas associated with uh, Rene Girard. To return to Girard, according to him, whenever differences are lacking, violence threatens. The disappearance of natural differences can bring to mind the dissolution of regulations pertaining to the individual's proper place in society. The eclipse of differences is apparent in the assimilation of Mormons within 10 years of their settlement in Utah. They were becoming more and more like the economically stratified society they had left behind. Prosperity itself had something to do with it, and there was, and still is, a powerful current in Mormon thought that emphasizes the unique dangers of plenty to a millenarian community built on ideas of material transcendence. Sensible to the risk of assimilation, Mormon leaders inaugurated what quickly became known in 1857 as the Reformation, the Mormon Reformation, a period of strident calls to renew the faith and exhibit fresh commitment to the ideals of Mormonism. In a sense, Mormons were reminded that they were a peculiar people and the customs that made them peculiar were emphasized with increasing vigor. The erasure of difference extended, of course, to kinship. In 1852, the church, church leaders explicitly endorsed the theory of the practice of polygyny and faithful uh, men of certain standing were encouraged to take multiple wives, and many, many did. But the rate of acceptance was not particularly high. And by 1856, church leaders were alarmed at the number of men and women who disavowed the practice of plural marriage. The danger here was in losing one of the most, if not the most, distinctive social practice Mormonism maintained. If Mormons adopted Victorian monogamy as their standards, then the reason for their persecution in Missouri and Illinois, indeed the very reason for their exodus to the West, would diminish in the same proportion. All the sacrifices they made, including the murder of their beloved prophet and his brother, would have been in vain. This constitutes what Girard calls a sacrificial crisis that threatened to undo the basis of Mormon social identity. Distinction therefore needed to be maintained. And so it is not surprising that the 1856-57 Reformation developed with explicit calls from on high to embrace the doctrine of plural marriage. Data indicate that the number of polygynous unions increased noticeably 
during this period. The erasure of distinctions, according to Girard, carries considerable risk. It can result in the eruption of violence within a community as its members find the outside world no longer serviceable as a receptacle for split off and rejected aspects of themselves. Uh, that particular idea I get, I take mainly from Howard Stein. There are reasons to think this process had even begun. In 1856 and 57, there were a number of killings in Utah, mostly of men suspected of disaffection from the community. Some were apparently preparing to leave for California. Although few in number, the murders sent shockwaves through the Mormon community of Utah. Uh, the message was clear. Disloyalty to the group could be met with violence. There were other transgressions too that met with violence reaction. More than one report exists of men, Mormon men being castrated by other Mormon men because of uh, apparent sexual misdeeds. In the midsummer of 1857, Brigham Young also expressed approval for an LDS bishop who had castrated a man. In May, let's see, May of 1857, Bishop Warren S. Snow's counselor wrote that 24 year old Thomas Lewis has, quote, now gone crazy, unquote, after being castrated by Bishop Snow for an undisclosed sex crime. When informed of Snow's action, Brigham Young said, I feel to sustain him. In July, Brigham Young wrote a reassuring letter to the bishop about this castration, quote, just let the matter drop and say no more about it, unquote, the LDS prophet advised, and it will soon die away among the people. Well, church leaders instituted a system of what they call church missionaries, whose purpose was to visit the homes of all members and interview them on their compliance with various directives. An atmosphere of intense suspicion was created leading to more defections and attempts to leave Utah. The Mormon Reformation had begun to consume its own. The sudden appearance of outsiders like the Fancher Party is, was then seized upon as an, as an opportunity to restore solidarity to the group by reasserting their distinction vis-a-vis -vis others. It is, it is necessary, of course, to construct others as utterly and irredeemably different. And this is what happened. The Mormon perpetrators later claimed that the men they murdered were mostly murderers themselves, having participated in the depredations against Mormons when they were in Missouri. The women, they said, were mostly diseased prostitutes and deserved annihilation. What of the children? Well, some claimed that the children, the, 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 they were children of wanted women, and they were all infect, infect, infected with syphilis and uh, were themselves carriers of the disease, and therefore, by implication, they, they were threats to the small and isolated Utah settlers. There is surely no better way to indicate the importance of maintaining differences than to murder the people defined as completely different from oneself. Mass murder is the perfect ritual of difference making. It separates the in group from the out group in the most dramatic way possible by making the former into the living and the latter into the dead. The in group knows who it is now because simply put, they are able to walk away. But the question still remains, what kind of victims are the best victims for returning a sacrificial order to balance? Victims who uh, deserve death function rather poorly to achieve this end, since it is always possible to explain their demise in relation to their own unsavory natures. Innocent victims perform much better. Simply killing all the men of the wagon train or waiting for the group as a whole to die of thirst and starvation would not have accomplished this, although it could have been done. Innocent victims must have their innocence confirmed in an act of killing so obviously undeserved that it leaves no explanation other than it is a sacrifice, in Girard's sense. A sacrifice of this kind, so pure and so perfect, ensures that its benefits will be great enough to restore solidarity to the group. It is true, however, that most of the innocent members of the wagon train, children under the age of eight, were spared, and this could would argue against the sacrifice theory of violence. After all, if the best victims are the most innocent, then surely babies should have been served best in that role. No babies, however, were killed. Two points are significant here. First, the fact that young children were not killed argues against the view that the killings of women and, and children were carried out by Paiutes. Indians typically killed everyone, especially the young, since children grow up and seek vengeance for their relatives. 
This suggests that the killings of older children were organized by the Mormon militiamen, not the Indians. Mormons believe that individuals only reach, only reach the age of accountability at eight. It, it would therefore be consistent with their beliefs that younger children should not be killed. The second point is related. Accountability means something more than just blamelessness. Uh, uh, it could be also mean worthy, prepared, or of age. The death of someone unaccountable in this sense might mean that the sacrifice literally does not count. In other words, one wants a victim who is innocent, thus young, but, but not too young to count as the appropriate sacrifice. To be sure, this is a stretch. <laughs> there is no evidence at the moment to prove that the murderers use such a logic in selecting their targets, but the ethnographic record does support the observation that in general, the youngest children are not preferred, no more so in fact than the, el than the elderly men in their 80s. Uh, there is something approaching cross-cultural agreement on this point that older children and adolescents prior to marriage make the best sacrifices to the gods, to the ancestors, or whatever. The more, now this last part is called polygyny and violence. I'll hurry through this. The Mormon Reformation of 1856-57 featured repeated calls from the pulpit and in camp meetings to embrace the principle of plural marriage. The call seems to have been heard by many. Polygynous unions increased dramatically. It is interesting that most of the Mountain Meadows killers were young and unmarried men led by other men with multiple wives. A significant number of the young men did go on to polygynous unions. What does one to make of this? One thing we know from the ethnographic record is that there is a correlation between polygyny and violence. The reasons are fairly easy to explain. According to some, uh, Alexander, Kanazawa, Still, and others, humans are naturally polygynous. I'm not going to debate that point. Humans are naturally polygynous, they say, and throughout the evolutionary history, some men have always had multiple mates. The mathematical consequence of polygyny is most obvious in societies that sanction and practice simultaneous polygynous marriage, as many African tribes and Muslim societies in the Middle East do. If every married man has four wives, for example, it means that given a 50-50 sex ratio, three quarters of men are left mateless. Now, if men, who, if, if men only practice serial polygyny and do not acquire multiple spouses simultaneously, then it means that there is an equal number of available women as, 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 uh, as there are available men. However, given men's preference for younger women and women's preference for older men, according to Bus, Kendrick, and Keefe, most of the now available women are older women who have been married and divorced uh, and have some children, while most of the available men are young men yet to have their reproductive opportunities. They do not make good matches for each other. In polygynous societies, most women get their reproductive opportunities and have children, while many men are left out of their reproductive opportunities altogether for life and spend their lives mateless. In more the more polygynous the society, the more young men face the distinct possibility of ending their lives as complete reproductive losers. This is the mathematics of polygyny. The bleak prospect created by polygyny makes men very competitive and aggressive, it is said because they must compete fiercely with each other, not to be left out of the reproductive game altogether and to win mates. That is why, some argue, men in every human society are more violent and aggressive than women, just as males of most other species are more aggressive and violent than females, according to Trevers. Further, the more polygynous the society, the more aggressive and violent the men become. What distinguishes Islam, for example, from other major world religions is that it sanctions polygyny and polygyny increases competitive pressure on men especially young men of low social status who are most likely to be left without reproductive opportunities when older men of higher status marry polygynously. Polygyny therefore increases the likelihood that young men will resort to violent means to gain access to mates because they have little to lose and much to gain by doing so compared to men who've already got their wives. This is why across all societies, polygyny increases violent crimes such as murder and rape, even after controlling for such obvious factors like economic uh, development, economic equality, population density, and the level of democracy in world religions. Regions are in world regions. Clearly competition with older males uh, for access to women uh, would have ruled out, would have been ruled out by the structure of Mormon society in Utah. 
older men occupied positions of leadership and authority and obedience to them was considered essential for salvation. In the absence of direct competition, therefore, what did the younger men do? Here again, the mechanism of projection and displacement suggested by Girard comes in handy. The hypothesis is that the victims of the massacre were surrogates, which served to conceal the true source of the killer's violent impulses. The Reformation of 1856 unleashed powerful forces, intensifying the pressure to conform and at the same time making conformity increasingly costly, especially to young men. The violence of the period has already been mentioned. Mormons were killing each other. There were a number of murders, especially in Utah County, I might add. And there were also castrations. The perpetrators of these acts largely remain unknown, so one can only speculate as to motives. <clears throat> Indeed, the formidable effectiveness of the process derives from its depriving men of knowledge, knowledge of the violence inherent in themselves uh, uh, with which they have never come to terms. One possibility, however, is in the nature of reciprocal violence. One more paragraph. Violence that becomes reciprocal, killing building on killing, can be described as a vicious circle. As Girard points out, quote, once a community enters the circle, it is unable to extricate itself. As long as a working capital of, accumu of accumulated hatred and suspicion exists at the center of the community, it will continue to increase no matter what men do, unquote. To escape from the circle, it is necessary to remove from the scene all those forms of violence that tend to become self-propagating and to spawn new imitative forms. The selection of a surrogate victim is one way, maybe the main way, in which to resolve the problem. It can be hypothesized that the victims at Mountain Meadows served this purpose by receiving the violence that Mormon society itself had generated in the course of its reformation. Specifically, killing the immigrants displaced and discharged the violence Mormon men may have felt toward each other as intergenerational tensions mounted, tensions that resulted at least partly from the mathematics of polygyny. The end, thank you all very much. <laughs>